Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we are discussing free trade. I totally almost said tree frayed there. Tree frayed. <laughs> <laughs> Those damn fried I trees. caught myself at like the last second. Uh, before we get started on that, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking wobbly from the Cedar Creek Brewery in Seven Points, Texas, and and, and we have uh, we only have one beer today, so uh, it's it's just one, right? Yeah, this yes. one's mine. And then <laughs> hey, wait a minute, I thought that was mine. No, no, this one was mine. Oh, we have a we have a half a gallon of this beer. So good uh, night. This should be an interesting show. What's the ABV on this one? 7.6. 7. 7.6. 7. Hence the name Wobbly. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, uh, I, I haven't had this particular one before, but the Cedar Creek beers that we've had in the past have been outstanding. So yeah, uh, I'm kind of excited selection. about it. I'm kind of excited about it. So we are talking about free trade today because it's it's been a hot topic in the news mm-hmm. lately. Um, let's, let's open up kind of with our traditional way of uh, what do you think free trade means? Because honestly, I thought it was something that everybody understood, at, at least it genu- generally what it meant. But as I researched and so forth, I discovered that a lot of people have a lot of different definitions for what it is. Yeah, so so in free trade, the thing that happens when you go to Walmart and they give you the, the little bites of food and you don't have to pay anything? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, that that, it, that it, it gives cancer to people because yes. they have to work in the mines, yes. right? Unrestricted buying and selling of goods between goods and services between uh, people, but primarily nations. People or nations. Good definition. It's a good definition. Thank you. Uh, what's the purpose of free free trade then? Because I, it sounds like something that would be that would be pretty simple. Uh, you know, if free trade is there to uh, to encourage. Uh, uh, Encourage countries to produce that which they produce the most effectively, mm-hmm. and to buy goods at at the cheapest price possible. Why would some people think that was bad? Because, uh, because well, people who are better at it get an advantage over people who are less good at it. Yeah, you can't have people that are good at things having an advantage over people that aren't good at things. That's oh. ridiculous. Uh, but uh, in, in all seriousness. Um, I think there are people, we see this all the time, you go buy a car, you get the car, the guy was completely honest with you about everything he said, but you really felt he should have told you more. You felt you were owed something more, and we get what this thing called buyer's remorse. Um, now, some people look at buyer's remorse, and they think, well, you, you just kind of rushed into something, and that's your fault for buying the, the, the thing, whatever that is. Other people look at that same thing and say, well, my, my tendencies or, or my, my natural inclinations or my ignorance even was preyed upon, and so it wasn't fair in the way that it was done. And people that tend to see things in the latter um, tend to think that that shouldn't be allowed. It, it's a form of a hustle or a... a, yeah. or a you know, so they they the term that I've heard a lot is fair trade. Fair trade, yeah, yeah. yeah there's there's that's been that's become the new buzzword uh, yeah. for protectionism is fair trade, uh, yeah. and and that's kind of what I want to do with this show is 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 look at you know the the logic behind free trade and, and compare it with protectionism, uh, and and at the end of it I want to be able to. to to say what is fair or, or, or what is what is just, I think is a, is a better way to say it. And have we ever really had a free trade system? Okay, right. uh, because I, I, again, I think we don't really understand what it is. the uh, The definition for free trade is something that encourages foreign goods into the country with minimum tariffs and allows countries to relocate. Okay, or allows industries to relocate. <laughs> so yeah, countries can move around. Uh, so the idea here behind free trade is. Uh, Keep tariffs low. It benefits everybody. And the country, the nation that produces the product the most efficiently will provide the product at the cheapest price. Um, but the other side of that is you have to be willing to allow businesses to relocate to other nations in order to provide that product at a cheaper price. Yeah. And that's the part that, that hammers people. Uh, it, because because the, 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 the backside of free trade is some jobs and some businesses are going to be inefficient in your nation, and they're going to have to go somewhere else. Yeah, it, it really strikes me uh, uh, funny and, and sad um, that if you took the same arguments that that politicians use for trying to keep businesses in their country 
either through subsidy or through restriction, and then you apply them to any other arrangement between people, let's say your spouse, all of a sudden nobody thinks it's a good idea anymore. Well, they thought it was a great idea for a long time. Nobody thinks it's a good idea anymore. But, um, but... You know, kind of the, the, the logic there... Yeah, yeah, explain that. Well, c- kind of the logic there is that these are our businesses, these are American business, we have some kind of ownership to them, and they're leaving, so we have to prevent that. If you said, this is my wife, and I have ownership, so I'm going to put in these restrictions to make sure she can't leave, all of a sudden we call that abuse. Yeah. Well, and let's talk about it in regards to uh, companies and their employees. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, if we implemented the same sort of restrictions on movement of employees between companies. Um, uh, There are any number of labels that could be applied to that. Um, But, you know, slavery being one of them, you don't have a choice. Now, you can argue, well, they're still getting paid. Yeah, they are, but they don't have a choice to go and pursue uh, more efficient employment elsewhere. Yeah, and and the they're still getting paid argument. Uh, first of all, it's weird because on the whole slavery name, there are people on all sides of, of the spectrum here. There are some people who, who use this term wage slavery, that mm-hmm. you can still be paid involuntarily there, but it's still slavery because your choices are limited either by your own decisions or by the nature of your environment. So that that's a type of wage slavery. But we also have people on the other side who argue, well, it's not it's not slavery if you're getting paid you you see a lot of these people uh, actually sometimes the same people who argue the other way uh, making this argument of against conscription or taxes to say well no but they're being or or, yeah. or land you know uh, uh, land forfeiture well no they're being paid for it so it's, it's not you know a form of, of theft of their labor or slavery but I would ask you for anyone trying to make you know the, the argument there about it not being slavery, if the slaves that were talked about, and, and completely different circumstances, I'm not trying to compare our situation to theirs. I don't, I don't think that's a fair comparison to make. But if the situation of slaves in early America had been exactly the same as it was, except for a wage was given, would that not be slavery? And I would also ask you to put the number on it. Pick the number at which it's no longer slavery. Because I think if we say they were given a penny a day in today's wages, nobody would be swayed by that argument. Does a hundred dollars a day, you buy a person, but you have to give them a hundred dollars a day. Does that then make the moral high ground at where it's not slavery? What is the number you have to give them to where you've, you've kind of bought their rights in such a way that it no longer becomes slavery? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to me. Let's, uh, let's kind of open up with a kind of a historical look at, at, at what is, what has been the standard for, for most of of the modern era, anyway. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say most of all time because we get back into bartering and all kinds of stuff. It's a little bit different. <laughs> and it, 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 as longtime listeners know, when we start talking about bartering, John and I throw shit at each other. So, <laughs> uh, just don't throw the beer. But, yes. Yeah, not this, no, not this beer. Yeah. No. Uh, I want to talk about protectionism a little bit because protectionism is something that um, it, it's another it's another buzzword. It's, it's the idea of free tra- or fair trade. And what protectionism does is it uses high tariffs to discourage the relocation of businesses. Mm-hmm. Now, this is this has been the, uh, the the major world model for most of the 19th and 20th century. You go back in the 18th century, we have have something called mercantilism that was real close to it. Yeah. One thing I would say on protectionism, th- there's actually a, a few other tools that I think uh, need to be mentioned on protectionism. Uh, One being red tape. Sometimes we don't directly put a tariff, but we put so much regulation around something, even sometimes to the point of it being obvious, that we make it almost impossible for them to import things. Uh, Some of that red tape, I I think, has some legitimacy, but sometimes it is clearly just red tape mucked up. Yeah. Um, You mentioned tariffs. Uh, There's also subsidies. Yeah. Local subsidies yeah. that, that that we use for that, and there's also quotas. Sure, sure. So I think uh, I think those four all. all I, I think they do now. Historically, yeah. they weren't so much as much there. Yeah. Uh, it comes out of this idea. Protectionism is a direct outgrowth of the idea of mercantilism. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, and you know, there's all these fancy definitions, but basically, what mercantilism comes down to is that all the money should be kept inside the empire. Okay. Right. 
uh, I, I, the British Empire is probably the greatest example of mercantilism. They reached out, they built all of these colonies, and then they restricted these colonies and said you could only trade with the mother country. Mm -hmm. Their purpose was to keep the gold in. in. Uh, but I always tell my students they, they they use the golden rule: he who has the gold rules. Right. Okay, so. Uh, if you're not if you're not buying goods from Spain, you're not funding the Spanish war machine. If you're not buying goods from France, you're not funding the, the French war machine. Well, mercantilism uh, was 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 the preeminent uh, economy, and it worked pretty well. I mean, you, it's hard to argue that it didn't when you realize that the largest empire the world had ever seen uh, up to that point, the British Empire, grew underneath it. So, yeah. So it was it was effective and it was efficient, um, but there 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 were issues with it. Uh, everybody was paying more for product than they would have had they had had open trade. So you you get this guy Adam Smith that comes along, uh, the kind of the the grand poobah of 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 uh, free trade. So so I have a question yeah. here. Um, so it would seem that war was the primary uh argument in favor of mercantilism yeah they were afraid of funding a war machine against them so it it would have been perceived to or i guess we can look back and expect that most people were in favor of that if it meant that there was more peace well they what ended up happening was the people in the in the nation proper the people mm -hmm. on the british isles were very much in favor of mercantilism mm -hmm. The people in the colonies were not so much okay. because they were being forced to sell their goods uh, at a cheaper rate to England than they could have sold them to France or Spain or some other country, but they weren't allowed to. Oh. Uh, they passed something called the Navigation Acts where mm -hmm. there was a whole list of enumerated goods. Uh, you couldn't sell naval store, anything used to make a ship, any of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. You couldn't sell it outside of the empire because they were afraid it was going to uh, – you know, fund the other, uh, fund a war machine. So what you're saying is the plantation owners loved it, but the slaves hated it. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. I don't know why do these people just complain about all the situations they end up in. Okay, uh, so so I was curious about that just because we we do live in a much more peaceful time. Well, we we, we, we do, but but that that argument is still made. Mm -hmm. The argument is still made. Uh, do, do you want to do you want to, to to fund an enemy machine? You know, we we think of the you know, the 20th century is a free trade time. We think mm -hmm. of the United States as being a very free trade country. But let's remember throughout most of the 20th century, we didn't trade with China. Mm -hmm. We didn't trade with, 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 we still don't trade with North Korea. We didn't trade with the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And the reason why was because they were our, our military enemies and mm -hmm. we didn't want to fund their machines. Right. Uh, now, we, we said it was because they were, you know, uh, it was a human rights argument in this, but that's not really why. It was, right. really, it, it was really the same argument. Mm -hmm. okay. We were really making a mercantilist argument. And I would argue that whenever you, uh, when you go to Walmart and you see the signs that says "Made in America, buy this," you're really arguing a mercantilistic argument right there, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Would it seem maybe more these days than in the past, especially now that there's communication um, among the individuals within the countries, not so much with North Korea, um, but potential for communication with people in China and and in now Russia, um, that opening up that trade would have the potential to actually decrease the adversarial nature between those two countries and decrease the support of the adversarial policies between yeah, those two countries. Uh, the old argument that free trade means free people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and one thing that I think is important to point out here when we talk about restrictions on free trade uh, and that we will uh, dive much deeper into when we start talking about the deficit um, is that there are two kinds of consumers that are, well, really three, but two of them have more or less the, the, the they can be combined. Um, but, but two or three different kinds of consumers, depending on how you look at it, that are affected by free trade. One is the government. Does the government buy supplies from mm -hmm. another country? The second one, and this, this is arguably part of the third one, arguably not, is businesses. Do businesses buy their uh, uh, manufacturing goods or steel, whatever it is, to manufacture stuff from other countries? And the third one is the individual. So when you go buy stuff on Amazon, are you know Chinese sellers allowed you buy stuff on Wish? Yeah, allowed to to sell to you, or has the government literally come in and said, 
you can't buy that. And I'll give you a, a real example where me, me and Anna have run into this. We were in Italy. If you've not been to Italy, the wine is cheap and fantastic. You'll pay more for water. So cheap. And um, we wanted to get some great wines while we were down there. We're not trying to get into the wine business. I mean, we, we brew, but we weren't trying to get into the wine, wine trading business. Mm -hmm. We just wanted some wines. We were willing to pay, one, the producer of the wine, two, a shipping company, three, an import company, and then go receive our wine and consume it. That's what we were willing to pay to consume this great Italian wine. We weren't allowed to. Not only are, are we as consumers not allowed to buy directly from Italy and have it shipped here, we weren't allowed to go to Italy, buy the wine, and then have a third party ship it to, the, to America because uh, uh, Italy from wine cannot just be imported by consumers it can't be imported directly it has to go through through third party uh, um, dealers to, to get here so what we end up having to do is buy an extra luggage bag fill our luggage bags with wine we actually end up not being able to bring back as much as we wanted yeah and hit l weight limitations uh, uh to get here and it really restricted our ability to smuggle wine well, it wasn't smuggling. <laughs> it we was, declared it. Yeah, we declared it. It was all legal. It wasn't smuggling. Yeah. But for us to, to consume that... It didn't get to travel as safely. No. Um, in we fact, lost one, one of bottle. the bottles yeah. ended up breaking in our luggage, surrounded by like our clothes as as packing material like it was a it was a fucking rag yeah so uh, i i think you know whenever you talk about this this protectionism uh people need to realize just in their minds that they're not just talking about can the government do something can can my business who i may lose employment for do it but they're talking about two people who are touring italy can they ship their wine into the country are they really ruining the economy for the rest of us i mean yeah yeah you know and some people would argue that we were. Yeah. We should have buying should have been buying American wine. You well, know? you made shit wine, and yeah. I don't care. You ruined wine. Hey, we buy plenty of American wine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, eh, it's not as good though. Yeah. Well, I didn't. You know, argue my, that. <laughs> my, my basic rule: uh, it, 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 whenever I go to purchase something, I look at it, and if it if there's two products that are, you know, of, of equal quality, and I think roughly equal price, I buy the American product. I'm with you there. But otherwise, you know, I buy the better product. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, that's that's just that just makes more sense to yeah. me. Yeah. So this in this idea of mercantilism, while the English were getting uh, inarguably wealthy, Adam Smith comes through and he writes this book that we're just going to call the Wealth of Nations. It was an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. But mm -hmm. Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith, 1776 book. Uh, he argued, and, and this was an a, a incredibly new idea, that a nation should not try and produce everything that it can because they can't do that efficiently. Instead, what a nation should do is they should make the product that they can make the most efficiently, uh, focusing on its strength, and you should import everything else. Yeah. yeah. Um, so kind of the first global trade argument. Yeah, well, uh, it was definitely internationalism or globalization, yeah. Right. But but I do think it, it, it's a short-sighted argument. I think it's an incomplete argument, should I say. I, I generally agree that um, specialization leads to efficiency. I, I don't think yeah. there's any argument there. The problem that a nation can and has in the past run into is when they over-specialize and then there's a huge shift in the market. Uh, you have what would happen to Saudi Arabia if electric cars really took off? Well, yeah, yeah, you, know? you, you, you you've got to you've got to to pay attention to the market. Yeah, there's, there's there's definitely issues with it. Yeah, so um, I think I think some amount of diversity is necessary, but I think any good business knows that. Yeah, they specialize what they do, but they're always on the lookout for new products and ways to diversify their portfolio. So I think there's there needs to be a balance there that maybe wasn't articulated in the original argument well, made. Adam Smith, did, did, I think he did a pretty good job of articulating it. He talks about about this market, and he and he uses he uses uh, wool as the uh, as the example in there. And he says, you know, uh, that the British wool market will probably suffer because we can't produce England could not produce wool as cheap as Flanders and right. other places could. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, but but the wool market collapses. But what what can we produce? Well, we can we can use that land for agricultural purposes, and we can produce corn. We can produce other things on that land more efficiently, and we're going to drive the price of corn down. Mm -hmm. 
So the in market person, you know, you might have lost your job as, uh, you know, as a sheep herder, but because you couldn't do that job efficiently, you should be retrained to do a job that you can do efficiently. Mm-hmm. Um, now that's kind of where he stopped his argument was, was with that idea. Modern free trade philosophers take that a step further, and they say that free trade only exists uh, only exists accurately if the government also interferes to the point of of retraining those people. The government, if, if you're going going to in, in, going to put a uh, uh, a free market in, you have got to also put a training program in for those people whose jobs are lost. That's a different kind of philosophy. Yeah. Well, let me ask then. If we're saying that the government's inaction is action that they have to answer for, I can argue you pick the, the protectionist program and I'll argue to you the industry that suffers. So do they also owe those people job training? Well, what, what I think what I think the argument here is that once you recognize the national advantage, okay, we mm-hmm. we have got a national United States. We've got a national advantage in the service industry right now, uh, international advantage in the service industry. That that's where most of our jobs are today. Yeah. Um, the idea would be that the government should come in and train its people to be efficient in the service industry. That should be what the training should, 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 should move you towards. And that's kind of what we did for a long time in this nation is we trained people in, in, in these systems for, for certain jobs. Um, the problem is the government well, – there's a lot of problems. One of the problems is that the government's not really good at deciding what, uh, what, what the next – uh, the next big move in the economy is going to be. What? So if you train them for something, w- what happens when the economy changes between now and the time that you graduate from college? You right. mean all those upset millennials who went in uh, after after government encouraged them to to college and, and to jobs that don't exist anymore and didn't go right into uh, 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 apprenticeship things? You mean the government was doing a bad job there? You think? You think? Well, uh, that's imagine crazy. That. Imagine that. What that you, is crazy. What do you think about this this modern uh, switch, though, in in the idea of of free trade, that um, that government restrictions have to put in be put in place there, even in a free trade system where you you know you have to tax. You, they end up taxing these, these these systems that have the the advantage. That that's what what's what the new idea is. Yes, we have an advantage, and that's what we should be producing. But now we have to tax that in order to fund the retraining of other people. Is that even really free trade at that point? I, I think governments always had the advantage, so I'm I, I'm with you. I think they've had the biggest advantage, and we should Hold tax them. How do them. we tax the government? Uh, they they need to start paying us money. Okay. Yeah. But how, where do they get the money from? Uh, well, they it. print it they clearly. It. Oh. <laughs> they clearly print the money. So, I'm glad you've explained that to yes. me. Um, so they've got to go through. They've got to tax these these areas, these sectors of the economy that have the advantage in order to to solve the economic disadvantage problems. Um, and the argument here is, any nation that doesn't do this will become politically unstable. And uh, I, I I think that there, there may be some truth to that. You know, there's any, economic instability leads to political instability. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Um, they also say that governments have to enable everyone in the economy to choose their own profession and their own area of strength. Um, that's quite a bit different from what a lot of economies were doing throughout most of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. That you're not really a free trade area if you don't get to pick pick, pick your market. Right. Here, um, here. And again, that goes back to your idea of the government pushing people into certain uh, certain professions by. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, tax abatements or or uh, uh, subsidies. subsidies, and sometimes even even something as simple as national campaigns. I mean, I, I know this isn't a good example in America because we haven't seen it as much, um, but we can imagine, and other countries have done it for sure. Uh, China's done it right now with, uh, um, I think, corn. They, they decided they can't live on rice anymore, and they're trying to push, I think it was corn. Anyway, uh, but the point is, uh, when I was a kid, I remember these commercials. I'm sure everybody my age and older remembers Got Milk. Yeah, it was a it was a huge campaign for milk. Now that was by the Dairy Producers Association of America, or whatever. But we can imagine the government putting on a national milk campaign where they're not actually pushing you in it, but they're they're encouraging, yeah. Yeah. you know, you yeah. to buy milk. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I I remember being in school and being uh, not just myself, but. 
um, our class and, and the other classes being encouraged to go into college to get engineering degrees because that was going to be the next big boom. I remember uh, being encouraged to get computer science degrees in the uh, height of the internet bubble. By the way, the one they're pushing right now is uh, uh, municipal and city management programs. Oh. That is being pushed big time. Let me ask. um, I'm sure government foresaw this because they are so smart. (laughs) <laughs> How many were they pushing into the uh, the big YouTube and Twitch and live stream and independent media sector that has just blown up? How many people were being pushed into that thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was out of school by then, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was teaching in school. We weren't pushing anybody into that. <laughs> YouTube? What the hell is that? I'm sure they're all doing uh, horrible now. They, they are. They're doing yeah. terrible. Uh, the other thing that government has to do uh, under, under the modern free trade, now I want to... Under- I keep coming back to this. Modern free trade philosophers are not Adam Smith. Right. Modern free trade philosophers would say that one of the things that that, that the government has to do is prevent monopoly. And the argument here is that that monopoly actually works uh, in restraint of trade. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always had an issue with this. I think back to the the 90s when uh, uh, the the U.S. government went after uh, after Apple. No, no, I'm sorry. They went after uh, Netscape. Oh. They went after Netscape first, and then went after Microsoft. And all of these were monopoly ideas. And I remember thinking to myself, you're you're actually going after a company for being effective and being efficient and using right. the legal market to 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 be successful. Um, but without a doubt, there was a point when when Microsoft was a monop or, or was monopolistic. There was a point when Netscape was monopolistic. I think Netscape. You could, I barely remember Netscape. Yeah, but for 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 a while there, that was that was the browser that yeah. that controlled everything. Uh, Internet Explorer came out and, and and just blew everything away for a while there. Uh, for a little while, sorry. Well, for for several no. years. For yeah, several they years. did. They did. No doubt. I'm, I'm older enough than you that I can remember when that shift happened, and it was it was a, it was a, it was kind of a shock. Now Microsoft Edge is just right on the hill. Of Microsoft that Edge. <laughs> Microsoft Edge. Yeah, it's, clinging uh, to the edge of the cliff. It, you it, mean? It, 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 it comes installed. They're forcing on, me on to go to the computers. Yeah, uh, they're forcing me to go to that at work. They're removing Chrome. <laughs> I'm going to be Microsoft Edge. They they they, they forced us to go to Firefox a while back, and, and I'd feel better about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I I don't like it. I like Google. But okay, whatever. But yeah. But, um, I, I do want. By to, the way, when I say they forced us, they told us we had to, and I refused to. So, yeah. um, I do want to. I do want to <laughs> stop and talk a little bit about monopolies. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't want this to be the focus of the whole show. But well, this I think is, it's important to free trade. Yeah, this has always been one where I've been a, a bad libertarian. I'll just say. Um, now I, I think we have taken mon- monopoly restrictions way too far. I think monopoly restrictions should only apply toward. Uh, uh, Physical resources, limited physical resources, um, but I, I can see an argument there. But when you start getting into, well, you make all the computer software. I don't, I don't really care. Well, you can, you know, in econ, in, in economics, they talk about there are there are natural monopolies and there are unnatural monopolies. Mm-hmm. And a natural monopoly is something that grows uh, intrinsically out of the system. You know, if you produce something that is so much more efficient. That you put everybody else out of business. That's a natural monopoly. Yeah. And I think that's something that we should protect. Yeah. But if you have a monopoly on on resources and you only have a monopoly because you don't let anybody else have those resources, that's a different situation. If yeah. you're an agricultural company that yeah. lobbies the government for protectionist If you're uh, Monsanto. I, I wasn't going to say Monsanto. I'm going to say it. If you're Monsanto. Yeah. <laughs> Name yeah. names around and, here. And so there are hundreds of other companies that also produce but can't produce nearly the way that you can. And you can fucking copyright genetics and yeah. sue people mm-hmm. because of the wind. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Don't you love it? But, but no, I, clearly. I, I could see I could see a situation where, you know, there's an element... I'm going to throw one out there that I know is wrong. I know this is wrong. You don't need to correct me. <laughs> but let's say that there is lithium and it only exists in this one country and uh, is owned by this one corporation who... Well, we, we, see, we see something very similar with diamonds. Uh, 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 De, De Brewers? What's the name of that company that... Uh, De Boers. De Boers. De Bears. Yeah. And, that's right. Yeah. I think it's yeah. right. And they use, and it's it's funny because they use very, uh, uh, and this is like resource monopoly, like the bad kind, uh, m- monopolistic 
ways and the way that they control the diamond industry and, and they slavery. get a free pass <laughs> yeah oh yeah, yeah they get they get free yeah, pass the beers, all the way the beers yeah um, yeah, that's what it is. And that's the kind of monopoly where I really have an issue. But most of what we call monopolies are not yeah. that at all. Yeah, you know? yeah I, I would agree. And I think I think that, that what's happened, though, in, in the last few years is I have seen, and, and correct me if, if you think I'm wrong here, but I have seen a new mercantilism starting to grow. Mm-hmm. I have seen where nations around the world are, uh, are, are reaching back to this 18th century idea of shutting off my, my my trade and 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 really much more mercantilism than just pure protectionism. Yeah. Um, and and that scares me. That yeah. really does because I don't I don't think it works in a modern I mean, economy. Trump campaigned on that shit. And I think he did. And and you know I got called I got called on the on the mat over and over again for calling him a mercantilist. And people are, he's not a mercantilist, you know. But it, to me the, the the whole idea of uh, you know Mexico is going to build that wall and we're gonna uh, we're gonna Go into trade war with China. That's, yeah, it's very, very much a mercantilistic idea. Um, yeah, I mean, he's he's thrown Europe, tons of European countries into um, chaos because of the uncertainty of what exactly his mercantilistic policies are going to mean for their businesses. But I think both of you are overlooking the most important part of this. It's Trump. <laughs> We made America great again. <laughs> now it's great again. You know what always bothered me about that is that 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 whole slogan was you had to assume that that, that there was a period when we weren't great at all, and that just always bothered me because I think we are. Well, yeah. and, and, well, and the same people. Uh, we, we we now have to assume with that slogan, either either that he has failed or is part way through, or that things are so much different now. <laughs> than they were two years ago, and uh, I mean, yeah, so much different, so much different. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hardly even recognize the nation. Yeah, Amazon's here now. <laughs> um, we have we have Internet Explorer or Edge as they're calling it. Um, and there's a wall. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, never mind. Don't encourage that. To be determined. Mm. All right, I I want to anyway. move into some 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 modern examples of uh, of free trade and protectionism with NAFTA and CAFTA a little bit, but I want to talk about the beer before I was we do about that. To ask. Yes. Okay. Uh, so let's kind of talk about this. This is what's the name of this beer again? Wobbly by Cedar Creek Brewery. It's a Belgian double. Yes. And uh, it's it's good. Um, who wants to start this one? I, I'm nominating Anna because she always makes one of us two start first. Okay. That's not true. Well, let's start first. Okay. I didn't want to, but okay. Are you, are you done yet? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, so I really like this beer. Um, it's it's nutty and it's oddly sweet, but not like ridiculously sweet. You say it's sweet. nutty. Nutty, yes. Okay. Sip it. It's nutty. Huh. Like you. That's maybe that's why you can't taste it. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a problem tasting nuts. I don't know what that is. Uh, it just doesn't work. She she can taste them really well. <laughs> I have to throw things at everybody today. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, as far as a double, I think it's a little light in flavor. Um, it, it's still got a, a very robust flavor, but not quite as heavy as I, I think that a double typically is. Um, perhaps that's because this is their first attempt at one. Um, <clears throat> but it is still overall a, an incredibly enjoyable beer. And with that, I'm going to give it a three. Yeah. Um, three? Yes. Okay. I'm going to tell you some things I really like about the way they did this. Um, it, it's got that that Belgian flavor, and I, I don't even know what to compare it to. If you don't know what a Belgian-style beer tastes like, I mean, uh, it, it's got a little bit of fruit notes. It's almost like the beerier version of banana nut pudding i mean it's 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 delicious i was thinking it's got kind of a date flavor to it maybe i don't know it's it it, it's fruity but it's not like any fruit i can describe um but a lot of times when you get a a a double a, a triple or even a quad they get the flavor right but it hits your palate and engulfs you Mm mm-hmm you're just smacked with this 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 flavor, and I've never complained about it. I think it right. tastes great. This is so smooth. Mm-hmm. By the time you reach the apex of the flavor, 
um, you've you, you've you've almost gone on on a on a flavored journey of its own, uh, and, and it's not the, a shock when you drink it. It, it, it. It's a very pleasant, gradual experience. It lingers for just the right amount of time. Um, it's 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 enjoyable. I really like this. Uh, you were saying it's it's not as as strong um, as. As it should be, I think it's. I think it's about right. I, 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 if if you made this much stronger, I would have to ask where a triple and a quad are going to go to. You know, um, fair. So, uh, all that said, great job. You deserve the this. This got the gold medal at the American Beer Festival. I think they deserved it. Uh, I didn't try the others. Maybe maybe this was the worst. I don't know. Um, but I, all that said, three four. Three, three four. four. Okay. Okay. Mike. Um, this is an outstanding beer. There's there's literally nothing I, I dislike about this. It's got got the bell curve that I'm mm-hmm. looking for. It's smooth. Uh, the flavor stays with you afterwards, but it's not overwhelming to you. Right. Uh, the smell is good when you it fills your it fills your mouth when you mm-hmm. when you when you fill it up. Uh, you can. I, I don't even know how to explain this, but it, if you can get, can get this uh, in your mouth, you can fill it all the way up in your head. It's just mm-hmm. it's oh, got yeah. this great aroma and feel to it. Um, this is one of the better beers that, that that I've had, and if I was this this is definitely my beer. This is what I would like to drink. Um, I'm going to go higher than both of you. I'm going to go three eight. I, think, I feel like an asshole yeah, I, now. You are an asshole. I think this is a, a, an outstanding beer. Um, yeah. Not a lawnmower beer. Yeah, uh, not a lawnmower beer. It's uh, it's a, it, it's a little it's a little stout for lawnmower beer, but uh, you know it, it's a campfire beer. Yeah, um, you know, on, on the date, I, I'm not, I'm not even going to put this by date because I think that does it injustice. I would have to say just just bring you know bring this out both on first date and and you know when, when you're you know maybe got to pop the question or something. It fits anywhere. Yeah, but what I am going to say is this is the beer you go find whenever you you get in touch with that that you know successful high school sweetheart. Uh, 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 cute that 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 girl or guy of your dreams, and you really want to seal the deal. You go find this thing. Th- this is really worth a trip to, to to take your date to the next level. Yep, yep. And hell yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah. Hell yeah. This is this will get you laid. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh. And you won't feel bad about it because it's only a seven point six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not not a Cosby beer. This will get you, this will get you laid just on the basis of the flavor. Yeah. Yeah. I am not adding that to our rankings of whether or not something is a Cosby <laughs> beer. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. They can just look at the ABV and find that out. Hey, um, you just put a Spanish fly in there, and it's it's a fly from Spain. I think that's what he called it. We <laughs> yeah, were all yeah. looking for that Spanish fly. I think it's Tommy Rufies. Yeah, oh, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Oh. So uh, that that gets us past the beer session. Hey, just out of curiosity, if uh, people wanted more of this, where could they uh, where could they, they hear more from us? Probably one of the best places is going to be to join our newsletter. Um, so for every show we release, we put out a newsletter. Not only does it include uh, links to the show, um, information about the beer that we drank, not just um, what we had to think about it, but uh, links you to where you can get it and who makes it and all that good stuff there um we're also doing a uh, a section on philosophy in the news which has been really fun here lately um and any other cool tidbits that we find whenever we release new uh new merch we announce it on there um quizzes quizzes we've got one coming out this week well nope by the time this comes out it will already be yeah, on the website i was about to say i mean the, this sh- we record a week or two before these come out, but actually, uh, not only did we just finish the content for a quiz that we're about to put up, but we we actually just finished uh, an article. Yeah, it's going to be going out soon. So we're doing articles and, and quizzes. Uh, yeah, I'll- we are are branching out this the SPP material to make sure that you guys have all of the ways possible to consume as much philosophy related stuff and craft beer related stuff. That we can possibly cram onto. That's right. If you can't get, get if, down your if you can't get enough of our crap on your podcast, you can get more crap on YouTube and, and newsletters. So <laughs> if you we, don't want to listen because we like you. If you, you don't want to like read, you. you can watch. Yeah, and, and me and Anna were actually talking about it while we were working on a correction to the newsletter. We Sorry. we kind of screwed up, um, but we were talking about it, and we're looking at a few other sections to add to the newsletter. So I would say this. Uh, be on the lookout for new content, but beyond that, if you get the newsletter and you say that there's something missing, something you'd like to see from us on the newsletter, 
uh, just hit reply and let us know. We we get those and we read them. We yes. do. We do. So, uh, yes, yes, yes. And, and get excited and respond frequently. Yeah. So uh, we, we, we look forward to hearing from you. Should All right. Good. Let's move back into our discussion on free trade. And let's talk about NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, I'll tell you, I've moved a long way on this stuff. Whenever, uh, whenever NAFTA was first pushed through, I was a young 20-something, and I remember being very much against NAFTA at the time. Really? I was. Uh, I was I was a protectionist at this point in my life uh, huh. as, a, as a young Marine. Uh, I was one of those guys that believed that uh, that sending jobs overseas was bad for the country because I, that's what I'd been taught. See, I, I was a kid whenever NAFTA went through, like a really young kid. Uh, 93, wasn't it? Uh, 93 is when it was signed, yeah. yeah. So I was seven. I was um, 21. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she was a third of your age in yeah. case yes, the math. I appreciate that. I did, not I a did. problem. Damn it, John. But anyway, um, so I was a kid whenever NAFTA went through. And, and I don't necessarily remember when it passed, but I do remember talks about it by the adults around me um, in the years after that. And I, in, in at least what I remember was people being really in support of it. Um, I thought it was a, if you had asked me without looking into it further, um, or if you had asked me at 11 if people supported NAFTA, and if, if NAFTA was a good idea, I would have been like, yeah, everybody fucking loves it. That was my environment yeah. at the time. Yeah. You know, and, and it's That's a strange environment to have been in at that time. Well, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. It, it's funny how, I'm going to say the wisdom of children. Now, that's not to say that there's so much. Wise, they're so wise they should just be running stuff. Oh, hell no. But um, the, the wisdom of children, because I think if you ask any child, in fact, if, if you're at home and you want to do this experiment, go ahead. Describe NAFTA. And, and describe it in neutral terms. The agreement is that us and, and uh, uh, other countries in North America are not going to charge each other a fee to trade with each other. Just And then say, what do you think of that? They'd be like, well, yeah, why should you charge extra fees? Because it will cost extra. <laughs> and I think there's just kind of this, like, this, this... Out of the mouths of babies. Overcomplication that we tend to do with these things. And we do it on both sides. And I think it's <clears throat> a necessity because people on one side of the issue are going to find every little nook and cranny to find where their argument can be right. And then people on the other side are going to argue against those and find every little nook and cranny where those arguments can be right. And then at the end of the day, we, we end up <clears throat> caught up in these arguments about whether steel should cost an extra penny or not. And we kind of miss the big picture of it, you know? Yeah, can't see the forest <clears throat> for the trees. Yeah, exactly. But I, I, can, I can remember being against NAFTA at the time because it, to me it just made sense that you, you, know, you, you should protect American jobs. Now, I, since then I've been a little more educated about this stuff, and I, at least I hope I have. NAFTA created the world's largest free trade area. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Now, later on, we're going to add CAFTA, and Central America mm -hmm. is going to come through. But NAFTA is, is Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. Uh, and I can, I, I can remember that, that, that Clinton do, doing his victory lap afterwards <laughs> for getting, getting this passed and, and Clinton, Clinton getting all the credit for this. But, uh, you know, this was actually first proposed by Ronald Reagan. Uh, it was it, it was actually pushed through by uh, by by George H W Bush, uh, but it's not until Clinton comes into into office that it's that it that it's passed. Clinton makes a big push in ninety two and in nineteen ninety three it's ratified. So uh, it was bipartisan. It was bipartisan yeah. because you know, there was a Republican Congress that pushed it through under under a Democrat president. Yeah, uh, I will say that there were a lot of people that were against it. Uh, Ross Perot and his Reform Party were kind of leading the movement against it. Uh, Attaway, which kind of makes sense when you th realize that Ross Perot was a businessman <laughs> that was trying to trying to protect things. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, that was an inside joke. If you got that, I hope you got a laugh. Uh, interestingly enough, U.S. trade with Mexico and Canada tripled after after NAFTA. So mm -hmm. uh, we we started purchasing more goods. Now this is the opposite. fucking shocker. Yeah, but but well, but there you know there there let let's 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 be honest. There were some some downsides to it. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, I'm just saying without char when you're charging extra fees to one place and not charging extra fees to another, yeah. where do you think you're going to buy from? Well, but 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 here in here in the United States, we did lose a lot of uh, of factory jobs. We did lose a lot of industry jobs. Domestic manufacturing has gone down uh, over over this period of time. Now, there's 
you know, what, what, what's the saying that you always say? Uh, correlation is not causation. Oh right? yeah, yeah. Correlation does not prove causation. Yeah. It. Uh, it we don't know that that these manufacturing jobs went down because of NAFTA. Right. A lot of them went down because technology eliminated a lot of positions. Yeah. Uh, but but I think we can fairly say that 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 a percentage went down because of NAFTA. Yeah, and and I just want to point out, you know. Um, the, yes, I, I think we can say that. But if you ever doubt uh, correlation and causation, or, or you, you you doubt that correlation does not prove causation, I should say, uh, I just want you to remember that um, the rise of, of the um, uh, manufacturing sector and the rise of the Luddites happened at the same time, so... I'm just saying Luddites cause well, and, and, industrial revolutions. And, well, and, and Hitler, Hitler Hitler rose right after Roosevelt. So, you know, you could uh, come with that one, too. But we can say, we can say Hitler does cause uh, Volkswagen. So, yeah, you know, there, so, you I mean, there you go. So there, That was your Hitler moment on yes. Six Pack Philosophy. I'm just saying, Beanie Baby, the whole Beanie Baby craze crashed right before 9-11. Oh, inside job. It's because of the chemtrails. Yeah. So <laughs> we're just going left here, aren't we? So trade is, has increased dramatically on an international scale, but but domestic manufacturing has gone down. Um, the net effect is uh, uh, in the United States, our GDP has actually gone up during this time period. Mm -hmm. So I think if you just look at basic statistics, you know, is NAFTA a good thing? Well, our our, our production has gone up well and i think before you can really talk talk about that and and i think part of the problem in the debate is we can't decide what we want because yeah if if, if you g give people a choice of like okay here's the deal you can have a job but you'll have less wealth and i'm not saying this is the black and white choice yeah. but right you can have a job and you'll have less wealth or you can have a job and you'll have more wealth, or you can not have a job for a little while because eventually the market will adapt. You'll have more wealth. So people would say, well, I, I didn't really want a job. I wanted wealth. Yeah, it yeah. Be. But it's never presented in those terms. One side is saying, you got to do this or you won't have a job. And the other side is saying this, is saying on the other side, you got to not do this or you'll be poor. <coughs> And, well, and there's there's balances to be struck there, everywhere. There is, you know? but I think, there's a, I think there is a legitimate complaint uh, it's based on fear, but I think there's a legitimate complaint to say, look, I've spent my life working in a factory where I've, I've pressed out this steel for my entire life. This is the skill I know, and now you're telling me I have to retrain for a computer job. Um, I think there's a legitimate bitch there. But I think, we, I think we need to reframe it. I think we need to put keep things positive and say, you did a great job. You press out all the steel. There's, there's no there's more no steel now, left. Now, now we need you to go and 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 press the computer. Now buttons. we need to put you out to pasture and let you die. Yeah. Well, no. And and the thing about it is, I think that the people who have found them, and I don't think this is across the board. I think there are definitely certain some people who do not have the ability to to develop skills beyond whatever it is that they're making money. But I think that is few and far between. But I think this I this uh, idealized American dream of you get out and you go get yourself a nice unionized factory job and and you work there for the rest of your life until you're 65 and then you retire and then you collect your social security and life is fucking happy. That is a that American dream is complacency embodied, and the well, and, idea and, and it was never there. Well, it, it really wasn't. It's a, it's a myth that that was ever this the the American standard. Well, regardless of that, um, it was pushed. I think well, that that people that you go, you become an adult, you get one job that you have for the rest of your career or for the rest of your working life, and then you retire, um, and. It did not promote the idea that you should be developing your skills throughout your entire life and that you can't just count on this one thing that you've come accustomed to being around forever. No, that's the saying. Put all your eggs in one basket. That's the That's, that's the what thing. you're supposed to do, right? Yeah. You're supposed to put them yeah. all in one basket. Yeah. But I, I think that it was a, a short-sighted choice for people to go into a job and neglect developing any other skills. I think so too. I think so too. Well, um, and, and I think we have to ask the question, uh, what does 
government or Henry Ford asked O to the horse and carriage industry that they displaced. Yeah, yeah. What what does Bill Gates owe to the mail service where everybody's sending email now instead of snail mail? What does the emerging market owe to the old one? And I think if you frame it in the examples I gave, everybody would laugh and say nothing. Horse and carriages are dumb. We need automobiles. But people tend to take a different view when it's in their backyard. Of course. You know. Fair enough. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, when I got re- researching this, and, and like, like I said, I was young uh, when NAFTA put out, pushed out, so I didn't. Uh, I don't remember how how controversial this was. But the U.S. Canada side uh, of the agreement was 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 fairly simple to push. We were willing to to sign. Both sides were very easily. But Canada really fought Mexico being included in, in, in NAFTA. Hmm. They didn't want Mexico in it. They saw no value in including Mexico in this. Um, They'd never tried avocados. Uh, well, well that, 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 that's a good point. Um, but but so, so they're challenging this uh, pr- pretty heavily on, the, on, on this idea because they felt like uh, a trade agreement between the U.S. and Canada was two nations that were – Roughly similar in their economic background, and you're not gonna you're not gonna have have jobs leave between those two nations. Oh, that's cute. They thought yeah. they were the same level as us. That's, <laughs> but, that's but not adorable. anymore. Now they think they're better. Yeah, uh, Trudeau. On oil, they are. Um, I wasn't making a statement. But, um, just say it. But but they were really worried about these jobs being being lost to 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 Mexico, and and we know today that uh, you know. A lot of jobs were lost to Mexico. There, you know, this was the age of the Maquiadoras, where mm-hmm. the these factories would go down and they would put they, they would build factories right across the border in order to get get cheaper wages. Hey, yeah. we're uh, technically a, a Maquiadora, yeah. uh, for, for our for our plan in Mexico. Your, your other job, not not yeah. we, you. Yeah, yes. no, no, no. no we, we do <laughs> yes, not. We outsource to Mexico. <laughs> we have thing. we have Mexicans looking up our philosophies. They give us notes, and we just read them. By the way, we're actually in Mexico right now, yes. speaking Spanish. You just can't tell. I, I've got I've got news for you. If I can if I can find somebody down there that will effectively do the research, I will take care of that. Uh, you know. If, Effectively and efficiently, go for it. Next week, Mike hasn't left. He just has a tan and an accent. Mike is now Miguel. Yes. Uh, uh, the other part that was real controversial about this was uh, uh, this, this Chapter 11 of, of NAFTA. Chapter 11 of NAFTA actually allows individuals and states to sue any of the participating nations if they act in, in restraint of trade. Uh, this has been a real issue with Canada. Because they have sued, uh, or, or they have been sued over and over again, over pipelines. Oh right! Because we're pushing these pipelines, uh, you know, from Mexico all the way through the U.S. up into Canada, mm-hmm. carrying this oil down, and we're building pipelines that are in violation of Canada's national uh, uh, ecological rules. Mm-hmm. We, we are violating their 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 sovereign states' rules. On, uh, on on the ecology, their and, version of EPA, yeah, or version EPA. of the EPA, uh, but because uh, enforcing those laws would violate the aspects of the NAFTA treaty because it would violate restraint, be restraint of right. trade. They've lost those arguments, and we've uh, been, been able to push pipelines through this late this place that they didn't want to. It's violated national hegemony in a lot of ways. I don't define hegemony. <laughs> Uh, na- the the ability for a nation to govern itself. Yeah, I, I don't Good know question. the aspects of NAFTA that govern that. Um, uh, I I can definitely speak in in favor of free trade from a phil- philosophical stance, but I can't agree with anything that does or may exist in NAFTA that gives us the right to say, not only do we have free trade. But we get to build buildings for our own import methods on that. Uh, you know, to me, when I think of free trade, it's like we can sell it how we want. Now, if we go to your border and we have to use your shipping company because that's the, you know. Now, I may disagree with the regulations. I hadn't even looked into them. They may be great. They may be horrible. But uh, to me, that that's that's not free trade anymore. That That's more starting to get into... Um, I don't, I don't even know what the word would be for it, honestly. 
almost mandated trade. Yeah, mandated trade, maybe. Yeah, well, it's definitely a violation of sovereignty. Oh. Yeah, uh, and 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 that's a, that's always an issue. Yeah. Um, well, but I find that to be interesting that they they signed this treaty that turned over that that ability. They are able to be sued now for for, for this kind of situation. Well, and, and let me ask this: and Canada's too. been losing those battles. Mm-hmm. Let me ask In this the too: courts. Cause, international courts. Because yeah. now I'm curious. How was the land with which the oil pipes were run obtained even? Like, did they just go in and buy the land? And yeah, they just purchased the land and they started building it. Because I know here a lot of it ends up uh, happening through through some kind of seizure. Imminent domain or something yeah, to those yeah. effects, yeah. Uh, but as far as I know, they just purchased the land. Uh, I, I could be wrong with that. Well, then uh, I disagree with the regulations that say I can't build a pipe on my land. Yeah. Uh, you know? But it's it's interesting to me that, that, that they're – that at least, at least on that aspect, the, it seems that the people that were afraid of NAFTA may have had a legitimate fear. Mm-hmm. You know, they are losing a little bit of, of, of national uh, hegemony. Um, let's talk about some some of the effects of, of NAFTA that we've had. Um, the U, I, I wasn't even aware of this. Mexico is the single largest uh, uh, purchaser of American goods. Uh, I thought it was Canada. I wasn't aware, but Mexico purchases more American goods than any other country does. Makes perfect sense. Um, uh, but, the, but the other side of that is um, the U.S. is also the import for about 80% of all Mexican exports. So they, they export a lot of stuff here. So it, uh, you, you've got to ask the question here. You know, uh, fuck would we build a what, yeah, I, I don't understand Sorry. either. Uh, but can we here. import it from Mexico? I didn't. I don't <laughs> can know. we import the wall? Yeah, yeah. Um, They're good at that kind of stuff. There, so, so we're getting we're buying eighty percent of all the exported goods from Mexico. Mexico is a is, is a powerful nation. We, we often forget about how it's an economic superpower. It is really a strong nation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we always think of it as you know our little brother down there or something. I guess. And if you hear the way it's treated by the U.S. government, it's treated like a stepchild. Yeah. But this is a a real powerful nation. And 80% of their stuff ends up here. That means that's that's product that that, that we aren't making anymore. So I, I I kind of understand understand the fear of there. But they're also the largest purchaser of our goods. Yeah, which means they're contributing to jobs here as well. If if you're gonna make the jobs argument of, oh well we, you know, so many of our companies outsource to Mexico. Well, they're buying a shitload of our stuff. They're buying more of our stuff than they are of anybody else's. And that stuff is happening here. Well, and, and you really need to look at the difference in the economies. And, and having been down there quite often, they are really good at repetitive parts. They are not great at specialized design. And so when I hear that they are buying so much and selling so much, that makes perfect sense to me. And if you think about the kind of products that you see made in Mexico on, that makes sense too. But somebody's got to go and build the machinery that builds those repetitive parts, and then they work the machinery. And that's a lot of what we're sending down there. Specialized stuff, cell phones. You don't want a Mexican-made cell phone. Uh, you want a Japanese, uh, Chinese, or American-made cell phone. Um, I'm sorry? I was wondering if there were American-made cell phones. I'm pretty sure the Pixel's still... I have no idea. Oh. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Not the point, sorry. You don't want I a Mexican just... one, is the point. Um, and in fact, they, they re- I routinely hear them uh, ask me about my cell service and equipment because they, they have a little more trouble getting, getting good stuff down there. Um, uh, electronic goods... One of one of the big things I get asked to bring bring down there all the time, funnily enough, Raspberry Pi. Really? Yeah, they huh. they, they have trouble getting them. Hmm. But th- that kind and of stuff. Are, never mind. I'm yeah, not going to go there. That kind of stuff is the stuff that we send down there, and then we get back, you know, toys or maybe uh, cast pieces for a car. The, and then people you know, go down there for cheap prescription medic- medicine. Yeah, uh, I've told the the story before of of my dad's smuggler friend. You can go back and listen to that. No, it's, they can't. Uh, you can can if, pa- if you're a subscriber. You can go to patreoncom six pack philosophy and then go listen to it. It's a good one. But what he was he was importing mercury, but he was exporting power tools. Yeah, that same kind of stuff. So all that stuff makes perfect sense to me from my experience down there. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, now there there is a there is a, a a human rights concern out there. Uh, whether it's legitimate or not, I don't know. But there is a human rights concern that one of the things NAFTA has done is it's created a system where where workers have been exploited, where where the working conditions in in Mexican factories are are substandard by American and Canadian uh, standards, at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, with me not going down there, I don't know that that's true. But they're clearly paid less money for uh, for, for the work. Um, and and the argument is, not even beyond NAFTA, in, on a pure free trade market, that you will drive businesses to these nations that have exploitative uh, uh, labor practices. Hmm. I, I, I can answer that. Um, as far as sef- safety regulations in the workplace... They're almost in in some ways better than us. Um, part of this has to do with the fact that their whole country is unionized and it's a government supported union, and so they literally train somebody and they'll do this one job all day and they have the proper PPE and, and they even have, in fact, they have a system that all and this is a newer regulation. All companies have to install on their computers and do all purchasing through. So that the government can correctly track taxes on all their purchases. They have to purchase it through a government-made program. Um, So in in a lot of ways, when you get into the individual regulation of these these companies and the safety equipment they have to have and all that, uh, they're better than us in some ways. However, if you start to dig into the day-to-day life of a Mexican, they will go to these jobs that have very... Uh, high safety standards at the job, and this for 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 the bigger companies, smaller companies, as they do here, do what they have to do to get by, and they will ride eight deep in the back of a pickup truck, going down the highway with a truck next to them with a tire that's wobbling because the inspection isn't done right. So if you look at the day to day, there's a lot of hazards that they face that we don't. It's the way I grew up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, if you look at the actual things that are happening in these overseas companies, uh, it's usually a lot safer. Now, you know, you have, you know, Jose's construction that has six people on it. Yeah, he may tell them, tie those two ladders together and climb up there. But that's that's not usually the companies that we're exporting that, right. that are being talked about here. Yeah. Uh, it, it, okay. So so there, there, there may be a... a at least a grain of legitimacy in this complaint is what you're saying, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think probably so. I want to talk about 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 whether jobs have been lost or not. Okay, because critics of NAFTA and critics of free trade in particular talk about the loss of jobs. Uh, it, it, you can pretty easily see that there, that that between 1993 and 2004, there were about 750 thousand manufacturing jobs that were lost in the United States. We started off with 750 thousand more manufacturing jobs than we ended. So just with that number, you could argue that that it cost American jobs. But on the other side, you have champions that point out that there were about 5 million service sector jobs that opened up in the same time period in the United States. So when you look at that, are we losing jobs or are we just moving jobs around? Mm -hmm. Um, If you look at, at raw numbers, between 1994 and 2004, in the 10 years First 10 years of NAFTA, uh, real wages in the United States went up an average of 34%. That's a pretty, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty significant raise for a, over a decade, 34% yeah. real wages. And that's with losing these manufacturing jobs. So I think it's hard. I'm just throwing out my opinion here. This is kind of where I'm going to wrap this, this is part of the discussion up at least. I think it's hard to argue that, uh, that, that, that free trade has a negative economic effect. Right. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I think when you when you look at the expert arguments, uh, experts who are in in favor of protectionism don't even argue that. They they usually are based on moral grounds or responsibility to our people. That they will even admit though that if we did this, the overall economy would be better, but the short term repercussions aren't worth it. So here's a question. Um, you know, we, we've heard the arguments that <laughs> since about 2004, um, wages have been largely stagnant. Um, and seeing this, this sort of, um, you know, NAFTA went in, we lost a bunch of, of manufacturing jobs, but we also added a whole bunch of service level jobs. But 
at that point, the vast majority of our employment force, of our workforce, is service jobs. Um, are we... I would have, at least, the information that I've seen is that the service jobs tend to pay better than the manufacturing jobs. Um, they do, but they don't tend to be as stable. And so could that be why we have seen a steep stagnation in in wages? Because like we've kind of hit I, that saturation of, yeah, I, I of think service so. level jobs. Well, I think so, and I think after 2004, a lot of those service jobs started going elsewhere. Uh, we started outsourcing to other places. You know, NAFTA, we're just talking about Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. Right. Uh, we're outsourcing to India. We're outsourcing to China. We're outsourcing to Central America. Right. There's, there, there, there's a lot more of that kind of stuff that I think is possible because of the, 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 the growth of the Internet uh, in, in, the, in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that just wasn't there in 1994 to 2004. Yeah. I was just going to ask, can I get like a high resolution scan of that? I want to put that graph on, the, on the video. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I Gotta think have, that would that would really help everyone that's, 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 ex that's great. explain uh, what's going on here. <laughs> Shut up. Oh, it's beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> All right, so John. Should I put a, an X and Y axis on here? You should, and you should sign it. I, I want yeah. them to know that that is an original work of Six Pack Philosophy, The it, Mistress. And it's right here next to my note. Yes. We do the ask. Uh, yeah. So, um <laughs> We're always we're always putting notes here for each other while we're in the middle of this. So, John, I'm looking at your list here. Did I cover uh, everything that you wanted to make sure what we talked about on this show, or is there something um, that we need to to go back and and talk about a little bit? Um, do 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 do. do. You know, I th I think so. Oh, uh, prevent uh, economic dumping. I, I I think that's that's one we need to talk about. Uh, so so one of the arguments for. Uh, protectionism is uh, that we need to prevent uh, this kind of gets into some of the arguments that uh, uh, Trump was pushing out early on about currency manipulation yeah. and, and, and dumping resources in order to to um the OPEC argument on on oil. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh yeah, OPEC a, a great great example. So, do we need to subsidize industries? So, with the whole OPEC thing, Russia was trying to get into the oil market. And then OPEC came through and started selling resources below the production cost to try and force Russia out. Yeah. And an argument's been made on that that um we need to protect these industries from that kind of other government manipulation. Well, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do we... Yeah, well, the, the, I think it goes back to the argument that, that, that free trade has to be free on all sides. And the argue, I think there's a strong argument people make. Now, I don't agree with it, but there's mm -hmm. a strong argument out there that the problem with, with all of these free trade agreements is that we can only control what we do. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to put tariffs on things in order to, to keep prices fair, but China's going to put tariffs on it, and Russia's going to put tariffs on it, and everybody else is going to put tariffs on it. So we're not playing in the same ballpark by the same rules as others do. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the same argument here, that, that a weakness of free trade is that there's, not a, there's, no, there's no force behind it. You can't force other nations to do it. Let me ask this. Uh, going back to the OPEC, I think we look at other industries as well, but at that point, they were literally spending their reserves, and probably, I'm judging Saudi Arabia here, Saudi Arabia, this is a judge look right here, um, but probably using less than ethical yeah. labor methods to... to probably. Get, less than ethical, that's... Less than ethical, Saudi Arabia. Um, but uh, uh, probably... Beautiful country, though. <laughs> I'm yeah. just saying... Probably uh, using less than ethical. Never met a beautiful person who was also shit inside. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with that. Well, that, just, that was harsh on Saudi Arabia. I just Arabia. wanted to throw I'm, it out. I'm going to take. It is a beautiful country. You went too far, Anna. I, I yeah. did. Um, I did. But Sorry. I, I guess my question is: they're they're spending at their own kind of detriment, hoping for for sure. for a return later. Cutthroat competition. Yeah. yeah. Now let's say they had forced Russia out and they could raise their price again. My thought would be if they raise their price again, Russia's already built the equipment. They're, they're not going to burn that equipment to the ground. If they ever raise their price again, Russia's going to be like, okay, now we'll sell it, you know? Yeah. So is there really a benefit to us responding in kind? I, I say let them do it and burn out their reserves, you know? Well, yeah, well, 
You know, the big thing in the Bush administration, uh, the second Bush, uh, Clinton administration, and at least a little bit into Obama's administration, not nearly as much, was reciprocal trade agreements, Mm -hmm. where we went through and we said things like, uh, you know, we're not going to charge you a tariff unless you charge us a tariff. Now, if you put a tariff on us, we're going to do the same thing back to you. And and I think that may be a balance that that, that, that you can do. I think that that falls. That's that fair trade argument. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, so uh, I I don't know. I the argument I always make to people is, but 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 we can't control what others do. We can control yeah. what we do. We can we can we can be free. Yeah. We can make our markets free, even if we can't control others. So. Yeah, and I think we really benefit. I mean, I know I benefited when that whole thing was going down. I got cheaper oil. That was yeah. great for me. And they lost their product at a price they can't afford. It's, it's, it's not sustainable. Yeah, exactly. And so I got cheap oil for a little while, and they still have a global limit on how high they can raise the prices. Because if they ever raise it too high, Russia's going to come in and undercut them. Or Canada, or the right. U.S., yeah. So they still have an upper limit. That never changed. And now I got cheap oil. I thought it was great. By the great. way, we still get most of our oil from Canada. I, I, I like to point that out to people. We think about OPEC, and they're they're on the international scale, they're, they're massive. But we get most of ours from Canada. I want that one to be on. <laughs> Our, our yes, page. <laughs> that's going there too, um, and they usually apologize for the high prices when they when they give it to us. Yeah, they did. They did. That's what I think every time um, I hear Bush administration. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have a, an idea oh, of Lord. what's on the drawing. <laughs> You've got an um, idea of the drawing. So uh, the next one is to I'm protect product standards, and I, I, I'm I'm really torn on this one, right? Because on the one hand, I think we've taken this whole thing way too far. I think the medical industry. Um, pharmaceutical industry is a huge example of this gone amok. But on the other hand, is it moral, is it correct for us to say, um, we don't want toys with lead paint, you know? Should that be something that that we go through and, and, and kind of regulate? I've just got to say the lead paint tasted good when I was a kid. So you know, snozberries. It, 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 it tastes like snozberries, doesn't it, though? Uh, yeah. I, I grew, up, grew up before that stuff was outlawed. Leave me alone. Mm-hmm. Um I, I, I don't know. I I think that there's a there is room in a even in a free market for safety concerns to, mm-hmm. to go through. And, we we want to be free, but we want to be safe too. I mean, we, I think about the old Saturday Night Live skit with Dan Aykroyd where he sold bag of glass to kids. You know, uh, y'all are too young to remember that stuff. Yeah. Uh, but but bag of glass, we don't want that going out there. We don't we don't we we, we don't need that kind of stuff. But uh, you know. I, some restrictions on trade when it comes to safety makes sense to me. This next one was interesting to me because I feel like it was honest. Because I feel like so much of this falls into this. But there are some countries, Nicaragua being an example, who do this honestly. Raising government revenue. We're just going to tax it. Not because we want to hurt you. or do. We just want the money. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you know. That's, that's their right. Yeah, and, and, and Nicaragua's situation is they have an economy in such a way that it's very hard to track the income of any one person. So they just don't even try and do that kind of taxation. They just say, we're going to tax imports. That's how we, we make our money. You know, that's how we did it our, uh, in our nation for, for years. Uh, mm-hmm. Until you, 1917, right? If you, yeah, if you look at our Constitution, uh, until the until the uh, seven, 16th Amendment passed the income tax, the uh, the only way to collect money was the selling of land and tariffs. You know, so yeah. Uh, God, good old days. <laughs> and, and this were one, you I'm, around in those days? Uh, no, were you? But I, uh, no. Shut up. Okay. <laughs> I think was I, you think I was advocating. around in 1917. Thank you. You were calling them the good old days. It doesn't mean I was there. It meant they were good. How would you they re- know? They really weren't that good. I was going to say. They were cheaper. <laughs> he made it the years between when he was 19 and 17. That's when. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all can all go uh, to hell. <laughs> I, 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 I told John this earlier on the show. If you, if, you, if you look at our videos with the shirts on, we look like a Dr. Seuss novel right now. It, I'm waiting for it one, it two, it three. It's thing one and thing two. Yeah, I, and they have blue hair. I had kids a long time ago. Leave me alone. All right. And, and, and the last one, I think we can get into a, a little more discussion about this in general. But to correct a, a balance of uh, payment deficit. So we, we hear a lot about the uh, national deficit and, and using tariffs to correct this. Yeah. I, I guess I want to ask more generally, what are your ideas on using tariffs to correct this? And I want to ask, like, 
What is it? Why do we care? I think it's asinine uh, to, to, to think that, that you can correct the national deficit by taxing your people at a higher rate. Which it, it doesn't make any sense to me. Stop fucking spending uh, so much. Yeah, yeah. The, you, you, you've got to do it on the, on, on the spending side, not on the collection side. Well, and, and something I, I do want to point out on this deficit is we're not necessarily talking about the necessarily – Talking about the same thing as a national debt. No, definitely they are different, although they're 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 related. Well, no, uh, we're not talking about the deficit of U.S. spending. Let me say it like yeah. that. Are you talking about about trade deficit? Trade deficit. Okay, yes. I misunderstood you then. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so, so you you think that the question is, should we be importing more than we're exporting? Yeah, and 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 sometimes tariffs and and these kind of things are imposed to say we have a trade deficit. So we're going to say we're not going to trade as much to correct that trade yeah, I, deficit. I, I, th- I think that's ignorant too, as, uh, j- just because I I think that that the you know the invisible hand of the market that, that Adam Smith talked about says that you re- you know the invisible hand which is greed mm-hmm. will cause people to act in their best interest and you will buy the product <laughs> that is at, offered at the cheapest price and that forces efficiency on the market. Uh, if you're you know if the most efficient way to, to, to uh, for the market to operate is in deficit then who cares? I'm glad you brought that up. I was actually planning on, on going into this. Producer, what are we at right now? How long? An hour, hour 30. 15. An hour 13? 15. 15. Sorry. An hour 15. Uh, this show is gone for a little while, and I, I really want to take a dive into trade deficit. Do you want to, right after this, we'll do a hard shot. If people want to get the hard shot on trade deficits, is it a problem and all that? Uh, they can go to our Patreon. Does that sound I like a plan? I think that sounds like a good plan. Okay. That sounds like a really good plan. We are going to do a hard shot on trade deficits. Are they a bad thing? Are they a good thing? What do they mean? If you would like to hear our hard shot on trade deficits, you can go to patreon.com slash six-pack philosophy. I believe the level to get hard shots is $5? I think it's 10 Is it $10? Oh, is, is, we're, we're looking on the board right now. I... Hard shots is ten. Yeah, $10. Hard shots is ten dollars. So for ten dollars a month, you will get a koozie. You will get our back catalog of old episodes. You will get to see us live as we record these shows, and you get our hard shots. The extra episodes, bonus podcasts. Yeah. What What is that? A, a cup of coffee a week? Yeah. For a cup of coffee a week, you can you can get all that content. Yeah. So anyway, a cup of Starbucks a week. Coffee. Yeah. It's not. It's if not you're brewing at home. It's a little more. <laughs> yeah. But um, for me, it's about. Two weeks of coffee a month. Yeah. Brewing at home. So all that said, go to uh, patreon.com slash six pack philosophy and uh, we'll see you soon. Two bags of coffee a month. Uh, I don't think the coffee math matters at this point. It was a sales pitch thing. I was trying to get the people to go to the coffee math. Well, this this has been a lot of fun, guys. It has been fun. It's always fun. Uh, Thank you guys so much for tuning in. What? Hey, I'm, I'm just curious. If they wanted to, get to to go find out another podcast that was interesting, where could they go to? So it's not a podcast, but it is a YouTube channel okay. that I actually I have come to really like. Um, it's called The School of Life. We'll link it in the description below or above or wherever it happens to be in the, in the newsletter you're looking at in the newsletter. Absolutely. Um, but it's called The School of Life. They talk... Uh, They do a lot of philosophy, they do politics, they do history, uh, ethics, psychology, all of these sorts of things. It's it's immensely informative. And uh, for our American listeners, um, the guy who does it has a, a, a British accent that is entertaining, to say the least. He says a lot of the words very strangely. Um... So even that part is entertaining. All right. Sounds good to me. The School of Life. Check it out. It's a lot of fun. Um, Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've had fun, and we hope you have too. I'm going to go finish my beer. Cheers. 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 No, 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 no. Did Alex get any beer? Here we go. Did Alex want beer? Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 